Now, today's subject, if every Melbourneian knew about this meeting and didn't have blink blinkers on and wasn't so prejudiced, they'd be crawling on broken glass to get here. This is the message that every human being on planet Earth wants in their life. They need it, but most of us don't know about it or don't want it. But deep down that's the answer to all our problems. Self-esteem, security, no more anxiety, peace of mind, confidence, calmness. All these wonderful qualities that we value as humans, the gospel gives you. I'm amazed that we haven't got 10,000 people here today. Because this is what every person needs. Dwight Moody, the great evangelist in the late 1800s in America, was going into a new city. He'd never been in there before. And uh, the train pulled in early. And so he thought, well, I've got plenty of time. I've got to preach in the town hall tonight. So I'll walk to the town hall. And uh, being a, a strange city, he got lost. And the, the, the clock was ticking. And he saw a couple of young people leaning against a lamppost on the sidewalk. And he said, excuse me, uh, do you know the way to the town hall? Yes, we do. Well, what do you want to know for? Well, I've got to be there. I've got to preach there tonight. What are you preaching on? He said, well, I'm preaching on how to get to heaven. And one of the young men said, how to get to heaven? You don't even know how to get to the town hall. <laughs> now, that's how it is for most of us. We know how to get to the town hall the church but we don't know how to get to heaven we're not that clear on this heaven thing I heard comments in Sabbath school this morning that make me think we're still not that clear on the gospel there was stuff coming through I thought that's just not quite the gospel we're still talking about doing things obeying and being worthy and gaining favour with God and I'm not having a go at you if you made these comments I know deep down what you meant I know what you meant but it sounds like the gospel is not that sharp in focus the Bible tells us how to go to heaven it doesn't tell us how the heavens go it doesn't tell us it's not a book of science but most of us, when it comes to the gospel, for reasons that I'll explain in a moment, we tend to treat it like Brussels sprouts. We push it to the side of our plate. We eat the carrots, and we eat the cauliflower, and we eat the prophecy, and we eat the chronology, and we eat the archaeology, and we love all the church heritage and history and we'll debate about the Trinity and we'll debate about the ordination of women and we'll gobble up all these things on our plate but when it comes to the gospel it's like the Brussels sprouts and it's pushed aside and you know why we do that? because the gospel tells us that we are far worse than we think we are the gospel is like a scanner that looks right through you and exposes you and me for what we really are. And we can get dressed up in our finery and go to church and look great for our friends. I would just like everyone to pay attention, please. If you have a mobile phone or something, please turn it off. Please. I beg of you. We go to church to try and impress each other on how well we look or how nice we smell with our aftershave and we've got the latest shoes or whatever it is. And the gospel says that is rubbish because inside of you it's the total opposite to the way you present yourself. And we all do it. We all do this. We like to look good in, to our friends don't we if they could only see what we get up to during the week 
when no one's looking and the gospel exposes us for our real condition. Now we've got doctors here today and they know when they have a patient who has a problem. The doctor doesn't just say, well, here's a whole box of, box of drugs. There's 25 boxes of drugs. You start popping pills. Well, what's wrong with me, doc? No, you don't want to know that. The doctor will tell you your true condition. If you've got cancer, he'll tell you. If you've got pneumonia, he'll tell you. And you may say, well, I don't want to be told I've got pneumonia. I'm dressed in my nice black suit and what will my friends think? The gospel is like the doctor, the honest doctor, that says beneath your veneer of respectability and trying to be a nice Christian Adventist that looks a million dollars on the outside, the gospel says no. No, you're carnal and you're sinful and you've got mixed motives and you've got evil thoughts and you have got terminal illness. That's what the gospel does and that's why people treat the gospel like Brussels sprouts. But there's a flip side to the gospel. The gospel also tells us that God is better than we ever thought he was. The gospel says you're worse than you think you are, but God is better than you think you are. And you need both. There's no point singing hymns how wonderful God is if you're not aware of your true condition. And you might say, well, it's not me, Herb, I'm, I'm okay, I'm a churchgoer. Are you talking about the drunks in the pub? I'm talking about churchgoers. Because you can be lost in the church. Jesus talked about the lost coin. That coin was lost in the house. It was lost in the church. The gospel tells us God is better than we think. And he's not out to get you. And he's not out to make you jump through hoops. And you must perform to this level before I will like you. No, no, no. But we think that from some of the comments I hear in the churches. Some of the old people in the retirement centres. You're still telling me, Herb, I, I hope that when I die that I'll be good enough. I hope that God will accept me. Adventists, been going to church for 70 years and they're talking like this. What kind of gospel have they been listening to? I hope that I will be good enough and that I'll be worthy to get to heaven. Hello? Hello? What have you been listening to? What have you been reading? This is the gospel. I want to introduce you to the God that I worship and that I serve and that the Bible presents. This God says, I didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn the world. I sent Jesus to save the world. No condemnation. For those who belong to Christ, no condemnation. He's not out to condemn you. He's not out to get you. He's not out to raise the bar to an impossible standard you'll never jump over and until you do he won't like you. But that's how some of us think. What kind of sermons have you been listening to? The Bible says no condemnation. Jesus received sinners. He ate with them. Jesus had dinner with sinners. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. And Jesus singles every sinner out and says, I want to have dinner with you. That's the God I worship. He's not out to get me. He's out to save me. To him who doesn't work, the person who doesn't use the Ten Commandments to be saved, the person who doesn't work, the person who doesn't use the Ten Commandments to be saved, but who believes on him, who justifies the ungodly justifies the ungodly that's me thanks that's me God justifies the ungodly that's me that's you it doesn't say God declares righteous because that's what justify means God declares righteous the saints. 
God declares righteous those who do good all the time and never miss a beat. Doesn't say that. God justifies the ungodly. That's us. Hallelujah. We talk about God as love, and he is. You hear it a million times. God is love and it breaks the toughest heart. It gets through to the toughest heart. It gets through to the hardest man in the world who has a head and heart of marble when he finally senses that God is love. That heart melts. I've seen it. I've seen some really tough characters full of objections and arrogance and opinions and theories and ridicule. And I love those sort of people. Because when they catch the gospel, the change is so dramatic. And it's always the love of God that does the trick. Not preaching, not theology, not archaeology, not debating, not winning an argument. That's useless. It's when they catch a glimpse of the love of God, that God loves them. Every one of us wants to be loved. 16-year-old was in a police cell. They're in Spencer Street. He had real attitude. He was Mr. Tough Guy. Eight hours in the cell and he was in the fetal position crying his heart out. And one of these hardened police officers says, what's your problem, mate? And the boy said, my parents don't love me. We all want to be loved. We all want to be loved. And God loves you. God loves you. Now you've heard this a million times. And it's the truth. But it's not the whole truth about God. We're not telling the whole truth about God when we say God is love. Because God is also holy. And it's referred to more than 600 times in the Bible that God is holy. I'll give you some idea of what God thinks of sin when we're jealous. Someone doing something in the church, I should have been asked to do that, and we get jealous. When we criticise a leader or a pastor or another church member, sin. When we lie, when we cheat on our tax. And our conscience is pricking. I'll tell you what God thinks of that. God hates sin because it has destroyed everything he's ever made. And sin is worse than Satan. Because it's made Satan what he is. Sin has made Satan what he is. Sin is worse than Satan. Sin is a cheat. <clears throat> Sin promises you gold. Gold bricks delivers lead blocks. Sin promises you designer clothes and delivers a sackcloth. Sin is a con artist. Sin is a cheat. And it always hurts in the end. There's a bit of pleasure there for a short time, but then the scorpion's tail strikes. And God hates sin that we take for granted when we criticise someone. Oh, well, that's part of Adventist culture. Let's have a go at the preacher and try and pick a flaw in his slides and get something, try and find a flaw in his presentation. Where does this mentality come from? It comes from sin. It comes from our carnality. And the fruit of sin is either unripe, can't eat unripe fruit, Or the fruit of sin is rotten. And you can't eat that either. But that's the fruit of sin. I want to just give you a glimpse into the holiness of God. God is so holy. That even the stars. Are impure. In his sight. What chance have I got? What chance have you got? Even the stars are impure in God's sight. 
Let's crank it up a bit. Even the angels he doesn't trust. That's how holy God is. He's way above the stars. He's way above the angels. And we carry on down here on earth as though we know better and we're going to tell God all about it and we're just going to do our little sinning and it'll be okay because I'm carnal. Oh no. You can't compete with the purity of the stars. If you can't do that, how can you compete with God? And you say, well, I'll keep the Ten Commandments. You don't keep the Ten Commandments. There's not a person in the world that keeps the Ten Commandments. Not one. Jesus was the only one. Don't rely on your keeping the law to get right with God. You haven't got a chance. You can't compete. And if you start obeying God right now, you already started obeying too late. You should have started obeying when you were born. We can't compete with God. And nobody can keep those commandments perfectly. Not even the heavens are pure in his sight. What chance have I got? I need the gospel. The gospel is something God has created. And if you leave this church today and say, I didn't like what Herb said, I disagreed with the way he presented it, he didn't emphasize this, you are arguing with God. Because what I'm going to give to you is the way God sees the gospel. Not the way I see it. Not the way you see it. Not the way Andrews University sees it. Not the way a theologian with two doctorates sees it. But the way the Bible sees it. And it's dead simple. And it's not advice. It's not good advice. You see a financial counsellor and they say, well, I've got advice. My advice to you is that you do this. Or my advice is that you don't do that. Advice is about what you should do. Am I right? It's all about what you should do. The gospel is not good advice. The gospel is good news. And news is always about what someone already has done. News is not about what you should do. News is about what has been done. And the good news of the gospel is, and here it is, if you're falling asleep, open your eyes and take a, picture, a photograph of this slide. Everything God demands from you, everything God demands, think of it. A big shopping list of everything God wants me to do. Everything that God expects me to do. And he's put all the difficult stuff at the bottom and he's put the easy stuff at the top. I can't even put a tick next to the first one. Everything God demands from you. Has already been achieved. By Jesus. And when you accept Jesus. And you turn from sin. And you make a decision in your head. I'm going to choose. I'm going to make a decision. To turn from sin. I can't turn. I'm over here looking at my sinful life. God's over there. He's calling me. I want to turn, but I can't. It's too attractive. It's all too seductive. It's all too glittering and beautiful. And this is, to me, at the moment, it's boring. I'd rather be over here, but the Holy Spirit is speaking to me, and I'm making a decision that I'm going to turn. I can't turn, but I choose to turn. I make a decision. When you choose to turn, you know what happens? All of Christ's achievements are credited to your account. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. You see that? It's already been done. The good news is it's been done. The good news is not what you should do. The good news is to accept what's been done by Jesus. And to make a conscious decision to turn your back on sin. And when you do that, all of Christ's achievements are credited to you. And God looks at you 
through Jesus and sees perfection, you might say, I don't like that because I'm not perfect. No, you're not, and neither am I. But from God's perspective, he sees you through Jesus. He sees sinlessness. He sees perfection. You know, when I know I'm preaching the gospel correctly, you know when I know when the little light goes on in the back of the church that says you're preaching the gospel correctly, I hope the little light goes on. When it sounds like I'm doing away with the Ten Commandments, when I get to that point where people think this guy is doing away with the Ten Commandments, then I know that I've got the gospel through correctly. Because it does sound like that. But I'm not. I'm not doing away with the Ten Commandments. I'm doing away with the Ten Commandments as a method of salvation. Because if we could keep the Ten Commandments, we wouldn't need a saviour. We could do it ourselves. Am I right? Okay. Uh, it's all very nice, but this is your typing. Where is this in the Bible? Okay. Romans. We are made right in God's sight <coughs> when we trust in Jesus to take away our sins. We can all be saved in the same way no matter who you are, no matter what you've done. Another verse. God in his gracious kindness declares us not guilty. How's he done this? He declares you not guilty through Jesus Christ who has freed us by taking away our sins. Now, next verse. Our acquittal, our acquittal is not based on our good deeds. Have you got that? There it is, in black and white. Our acquittal is not based on what we do. Now Annie, who I love dearly, and I've come to know her in the last two weeks, is not able to, to do good deeds. She's confined to a wheelchair. But she's embraced the gospel. She's embraced the gospel. She's not able to work with her hands. She's not able to do good works with her feet. She's confined to a wheelchair. And I believe God has brought Annie to this church to bring home the point that salvation is not based on what you do. Because Annie can't do much. But Annie does an awful lot by her testimony as she taps out messages of faith on that little machine. You ought to see it. We are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. I mean, how much clearer can this be? I am quoting Romans 3 verse 27. I didn't write it. We are not made right with God by obeying the law. How much clearer can that be? And yet there are still people among us who want to argue with this. You've been trying to obey since you became a Christian. How are you performing? How is your performance? How are you doing? You got a 9 out of 10? Or are you still down there with a 1 out of 10? How many years will it take? How can you pay for something infinite with something finite? Salvation is not by what you bring to Christ. Salvation is by what you take from Christ. God is offering you something. God is not demanding something from you. And he's offering you a gift. And therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, what's the result? You have peace of mind. And he is at peace. And he has, has got more calm and more peace than most of us. And she's got more problems than most of us because she understands the gospel. Peace of mind, because you're not looking at yourself, how well you're doing. Am I good enough? Will I get to heaven? Am I worthy? Oh, gee, I hope God is not angry with me. And all this rubbish that is more Catholic than Christian. 
and it's infiltrated our church. Thank God the gospel winds are starting to blow. It's taken a while. It's been done, folks. That's news. News is about what's been done. Advice is about what you should do. Embrace it. Oh, well, you're doing away with the law, Herb. No, I'm not. Here it is. Romans 3.31. If we emphasize faith, does this mean that we can forget about the law? Of course not. I just had to slip that one in so everyone understands I am not doing away with the law. I'm doing away with the law as a method of salvation because the Bible does away with the law as a method of salvation. And parents, if you're here and you've been telling your children that they've got to jump through all these hoops or God will not accept them in heaven, you need to go back and apologise to them and you need to tell them that you have misunderstood the gospel. It is not a method of salvation. And I will show you as we progress. This makes you jump for joy. Young boy was travelling in the country with his father through a dairy through a dairy area with all these black and white Frisian cows. And he's looking out the window at the cows with all their long faces. You know how cows look, you know. And he says to his dad, gee, dad, look at all the Christians out there. And the dad said, what do you mean Christians? They're cows. He said, they've all got long faces. That's because most people don't understand the gospel. And that's why we pick on each other in church. We find each other's faults and flaws. Because we're all busy looking at each other and ourselves and we don't look at what's been done. That's why churches can be very critical places. Churches without the gospel are some of the most unattractive buildings on earth. And a churchgoer who doesn't understand the gospel is one of the most dangerous people in the world. Look at radical Islam. That's why I can stand here and preach and not feel like a hypocrite. That's why Yola can sing and not feel like a hypocrite. That's why people can give a testimony in church and not feel like a hypocrite. That's why medical missionaries can work for others and tend to the poor and not feel like a hypocrite. Because the gospel has released them from the guilt. They've accepted the gift. It's been done. It's a done deal. And I put my trust in that gift, not in me. And that's why I can stand and preach and go on YouTube and have a website and go on 3ABN. Not because I'm better than you. But because I accepted the gospel. And I can now work for God freely without feeling like a hypocrite. If you're writing notes and you value what you're hearing and you want to make absolutely sure it is from God and not some preacher with fine words, and you want to get it straight from the Bible, you write down these chapters, Romans 3, 4 and 5, and you read those today before the sun sets, preferably in a modern translation, or in any translation. Read it in any translation, until the lights come on. Now I've shown these chapters to many, many Adventists trapped in legalism and the lights have come on. Hallelujah. Straight from the Word of God. Romans 3, 4 and 5. Will you do that? It's more valuable than gold. It's more valuable than a truck full of diamonds. What's in those chapters. And that's what you'll be clinging to on your deathbed. Not the mark of the beast, not archaeology, not the ordination of women, not the trinity, not the investigative judgment, not the Jewish festivals. You'll be clinging to this. And those Brussels sprouts will taste just fine. I'll tell you why the gospel is simple. Because the people who heard Jesus and the apostles had no books, had no scrolls, 
had nothing. They went back to their mud house, mud brick houses. They didn't have bookcases bursting with books like we do. They had nothing. They had a mat to sleep on, clay pots to make some food, and a little table to sit at. That's it. No bookcases, nothing. And yet they heard the gospel from Jesus. They believed it. They received it. And it changed their life. It's got to be simple if that's how it was. There's the apostles preaching. They didn't say, oh, well, I'm going to go back and look it up in the commentary and make sure that what he said was right. And I'll send him an email and correct him. They believed the gospel. They heard it. They went home. They believed it in their heart and it changed their lives. That's how simple the gospel has to be. If it can work under those conditions, surely it can work under this first Adventist church built in the southern hemisphere. It's got to be simple. It's not theology. It's not commentary. It doesn't need PhDs to come over and explain it all to you. It is dead simple. It's a free gift. Now wait a minute, I thought a gift was free. If you get a gift, it's free, isn't it? Normally. Paul uses the expression, it's a free gift. Dummy, dummy, you got it? Now if my wife says to me, Herb, I went to David Jones and I found a shirt for your birthday. It is just perfect for you. It's the right sleeve length, it's the right collar size. Pink may not be your colour, but we can pick another colour. Um, you'll love it. It's for your birthday. And I say, well, that's fantastic, darling. Thank you. And she says, it's going to cost you $100. It's no longer a gift, is it? And that's why Paul says the gospel is a free gift. <laughs> God doesn't say, here's salvation for you, but it's going to cost you. It costs you nothing. You just accept it. You make the decision to say, I believe the promise. I believe what you're telling me. I accept it by faith. That's it. What Jesus has done. It's a free gift in case you haven't got the message. Now we make excuses. I used to make them before I was converted. And the, the, the most popular one is too many hypocrites in the church. Am I right? I don't want to join a church. It's full of hypocrites, nasty people criticising each other, blah, blah, blah. unbearable atmosphere. I don't want to join the church. I'm not asking you to join the church. I'm asking you to accept Jesus. Is he a hypocrite? Now the thief on the cross, a rogue, rough, ready, criminal, uneducated, unable to read probably, hardened criminal. In those times they would have been pretty awful. He accepted Jesus. He could have come up with the excuse, well, what about all those hypocrites down there? What about all those religious leaders down there who put Jesus on the cross? Look at them all. Church is full of hypocrites. I'm not going to accept Christ. Doesn't make sense, does it? He could have looked at his mate on the other side of Jesus who was swearing and cursing and he could have thought, well, I'll join him. I'll go with my mates. I'll go with my mates. He didn't do that either. He could have looked at the soldiers down there who were completely indifferent. Switched off. Didn't care. Then he could have said, well, I'll be like the soldiers. I'll be indifferent. I'm not going to make a decision. To decide not to is to decide not to. Not to decide is to decide not to. <laughs> to say, well, I'm not leaving this church. I'm, I'm leaving this church today and I'm not going to make a decision. If that's your position, you have made a decision. You've decided not to. That's a decision. You either accept him or you reject him. But make a decision. Because I'm going to ask for you to make a decision by the close of this meeting. It's not something we do in Adventist churches anymore because, oh, I don't want to embarrass myself. Well, you think about Jesus Christ on the cross as you wallow in your embarrassment. 
The other excuse he could have used is, well, I'll just join the, what the mob is saying. I'll follow the herd. I'll follow the majority. <clears throat> and they were all saying, oh, well, he saved others. He can't save himself. How true a statement is that? It's because he saved others that he didn't save himself. So these are the excuses that are normally run by us. So what is salvation? I had an email from a chap. I posted something on Facebook. And uh, he posted something back. What are we being saved from anyway? Saved from what? Was his reply. I know him fairly well. I didn't take offence. I like the hard nuts. <laughs> because they make the best converts. The people that are the hardest to convince when they do make a decision are on fire for God. The people that are easy to convince are out of it within a week. You say, what am I saved from? You're saved from the guilt of sin. And guilt destroys people. I had a word with a GP during the week and he was telling me what guilt can do to a person. People suicide over guilt. People's marriages break up over guilt. Guilt. It's one of the most destructive feelings in the emotional makeup of mankind. Guilt. And the gospel frees you from the guilt of sin. You feel guilty what you did 20 years ago? Nightclubbing, drinking, women. Feel guilty? And you're still carrying this load even though you say you're a Christian. You haven't been freed from the guilt of sin. The gospel takes the guilt away. How does it do that? Because the guilt was put on Christ. And when the guilt goes, sin has no power over you anymore. Because when the guilt goes, the power goes. Sin has power over us because it makes us feel guilty. And when the guilt goes, there's no more power. Sin is no longer the boss when we see Jesus on the cross. And the last one, when Jesus comes, we are freed from the presence of sin. That's what you're saved from. The first two you've got right now. Right now. You're carrying guilt. Things you did years ago, you're still dragging it around. You know, it's like that guy who accidentally ran over the neighbor's cat. And he buries the cat because he doesn't want to tell the neighbor, but he feels guilty. So he goes and knocks on the neighbor's door and says, look, I'm sorry, but I accidentally killed your cat three days ago. It was a mistake. Please don't hold it against me. Where's the cat? Well, he's buried in my backyard. Oh, well. Thanks for telling me. And then three days later, he knocks on the door with the cat. With the cat. And says, look, I'm sorry, I killed your cat six days ago. And the guy says, what? I've forgiven you. Put him back in the grave. And he buries the cat again and he digs up the cat again. And the neighbour's going crazy and thinking, this guy has no understanding of forgiveness. You don't bring the dead cat back to the Lord Jesus saying, oh, please forgive me what I did 20 years ago. The guilt is gone. The sin's been forgiven. And when the guilt goes, the power of sin goes. Sin has no longer dominion over you, says Paul. You understand what that word means now? Sin doesn't have dominion over you because the guilt is gone. So what's the gospel in a nutshell, Herb? You've been raving on for half an hour. He's advertised this as a nutshell. You know, when I first came into this church, I saw that tapestry there. And that gave me the idea of this gospel in a nutshell. Because the gospel in a nutshell is right there behind me. There you have the gospel in a nutshell. Let me explain it to you. The unrepentant thief on the left of Jesus had sin on him and sin in him. The repentant thief to the right of Jesus 
had sin in him, but no longer on him. Where did it go? It went to the man on the center cross, who had sin on him, but not in him. That is the gospel in a nutshell. So every time you come into North Fitzroy Church and you see that tapestry, think about that. Are you there? Or are you here? Which is it? You can't be on the centre cross. That's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He had it on him, but it was transferred to Jesus. That's the gospel. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, worked in the worst slums of London when he formed the Salvation Army and he said to his young Christian soldiers, when he gave them their first orders for the day, and they said, what do you want us to do, General? Where are you sending us? Do we go to the high society and try and convince them of the gospel and they'll make a terrific role model and example and they'll convince everyone else and William Booth said no no we're going to go to the worst of the worst why? he said because when people see the worst person with filthy clothes, filthy feet filthy language alcohol coming out of their ears when he sees, when people see the transformation in that person that the gospel has created, they'll be so impressed they'll want to know about the gospel. And that's why he chose the worst of the worst. Thief on the cross was the worst of the worst. And the gospel could reach even him. I'm sure it can reach you because. and me. And so we're all like Barabbas. You're a Barabbas, you're Mrs. Barabbas, you're Miss Barabbas, I'm Mr. Barabbas. We are all Barabbas. We are all lawbreakers. All of us. We've all broken the law. And we should all be in jail. And we should all be facing the execution squad like Barabbas. Now this story is told in the, in the Bible to drive the point home that Barabbas the guilty was set free because the innocent was made captive. The innocent was treated like the criminal so the criminal could be treated like the innocent. That's the gospel. It's a substitution. He took our place. You don't have to go and say, well, I'm free. I'm out of jail. And Jesus is now the prisoner. But I feel guilty. I'm going to go back in jail. Because I feel guilty about what I did. And you lock yourself back into the jail cell. You're free. Because Jesus the innocent. Is treated like the guilty. It says in Corinthians. God made Jesus who knew no sin. To be sin. To be sin for us. Jesus was treated like trash. So we could be treated like royalty. God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us. So that the righteousness of God could be made in us through him. It's the gospel. It's scattered right through the Bible. And Ellen White has even got it. For those who quote Ellen White and send me lengthy papers. Ellen White says this and Ellen White says that. Well let me show you what Ellen White says. Don't be anxious about what God thinks of you. Be anxious about what God thinks of Christ, your substitute. Bible. Makes you want to leap for joy, doesn't it? Yes? We should all be leaping out of our pews and saying, Wow, that, that is fantastic. Well, let's just press on and make sure we've got this absolutely biblically correct. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption in Christ Jesus, the word justified means to be declared righteous, 
to be legally given the not guilty verdict. God regards you righteous. God treats you as righteous. God regards you as righteous in Christ. That's what justified means. And it just means just as if I'd never sinned. That's how God looks at you. When you accept Christ, he looks at you just as if you'd never sinned. Because he sees you through Christ. He sees you through Christ. He sees perfection. Because you're in Christ. Just as if I'd never sinned. And some people say, oh well, that's great, but that's only for your past. That's for all your past sins. Up to the day of your conversion. Justification covers your past. And they quote this verse, Romans 3.25, to say that you're only justified for your past. But from the day of your conversion, you're on your own, baby. You're on your own. And you better perform, and you'd better obey, and you'd better do, 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 do. Cock a doodle do. <laughs> or else God won't love you anymore. Justification doesn't reach right up over your Christian life to your death. And they quote this verse. Now this verse says nothing about justification being only for your past. This is just saying before Jesus died on the cross, God did not punish the sins of the world before the cross. The sins of the past because of his forbearance. That's all that's saying. God should have. God should have punished all those people before Jesus died on the cross, but because of his love and forbearance, he didn't. That's what that verse is saying. Uriah Smith, one of our pioneers, believed that justification only covers you up to your point of your conversion, and then you're on your own. No, that's a false gospel. I'm sorry. That is a false gospel. Because here is the verse that proves it wrong. All have sinned, past tense, and fallen short of the glory of God, present continuous tense. In other words, all continue to fall short of the glory of God. All continue to fall short. And the remedy for that is present continuous justification the Greek is present continuous the Greek at the top is past all have sinned past tense and continue to fall short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace present continuous it covers you like a gigantic doona from the day of your conversion, as long as you abide in Christ, as long as you follow him, put your trust in him, choose to turn from sin, as long as you have, keep making those choices, you're justified till the day you die. Now when you start sinning willfully and saying, I don't want God anymore, justification is removed, of course. But as long as you abide in Christ, Justification covers you like the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. It is finished. One Greek word. He just, it was one word. And he said, tetelestai. You know what that means? Paid in full. He didn't say, he didn't say partly paid. I've saved some of them and it's up to them to finish the job. Paid in full. That's why he said it's finished. He didn't say it's partly finished. And so in the judgment, instead of worrying about how you'll stand in the judgment, you've got the verdict of the judgment now if you're in Christ. And it's not guilty. Not guilty. You've got the verdict now of the future judgment when your name comes up you've got the verdict now as long as you abide in Christ not guilty through works can't be through works and he can't work thief on the cross can't work he was tied his feet were tied he wasn't going anywhere he couldn't do any good works 
The only thing that was still working was his brain that said, I choose Christ. And he made a decision and he reached out to Christ. Not through works. And I'll tell you why. Did you have anything to do with Adam's sin? Were you involved? Were you there? A lot of people say, it's not fair, Lord. I've inherited this sin problem. I wasn't there. I didn't steal the fruit from the garden. We have nothing to do with it. Am I right? It's not fair, is it? Had nothing to do with it. We were all ruined by the first Adam without our personal participation. But now the good news. We are redeemed by the second Adam without our participation. The redemption comes without our participation. Just as condemnation came without your participation. And you read that in Romans 5. and Ephesians it says God saved you by his special favour when you believed. You can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Ephesians says salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done so that none can boast about it. It's like a pile driver, isn't it? Bang! 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 Have you got it yet? Text after text after text after text that says it's not through works. Even in the Old Testament it wasn't through works. When evangelicals say, well, Herb, you preach a good gospel, but the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, it was all through works. And now we're under the New Covenant and we don't need works. Well, let me take you to the Old Testament and we go to the time when the Israelites were captive in Egypt, prisoners of the Egyptians, just like we are captive in sin. And the Lord said, Put the blood on the top of the door. What a crazy thing to do is that. And the people are laughing at these believers putting, doing this stupid act. Blood on the door? Doesn't make sense. No scientist would accept it. No intellectual would accept it. It is foolishness to the natural man. And God says, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. My destroying angel won't destroy you the firstborn in your household, when I see the blood, not when I see your good works, not when I see your denomination, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. They were still prisoners in Egypt and that was salvation. Then they were baptised in the Red Sea. Then they were given the law. You got it? You see the order of business? You see the way God does business? Salvation first. Freed from Egyptian captivity. Freed from sin's grasp of captivity. Baptised in the Red Sea. Then they were given the law. Salvation first. Changed heart. Accept God's gift by faith. Believe in the blood Apply the blood and put your faith in the blood. Then you're called to obey. But many people do it this way. Obedience first. Then baptism. When you're good enough. And then somebody will preach the odd sermon once a year on the gospel. No, that is not the way of the Bible. This is the way of scripture. Salvation first, baptism second. Then you follow Christ in a life of holiness. You see? Not to be saved. You've already been saved. You've been saved. And the obedience comes as the fruit of your salvation, not the root. Every false religion in the world, and there they are. I'm not going to name them. You work it out. Every false religion in the world wants you to do something. They're always adding something that you've got to do. Every false gospel does this. To be saved. To appease an angry God. To win God's favour. They all do it. And when we say the Ten Commandments are a method of salvation, we might as well join this club. 
because we're basing our faith on our works and not on what Jesus has already done. And that is blasphemy. Ten Commandments are a standard of conduct. They're not a means of salvation. Now if I come along and say, look, here's a rosebud, and I want this rosebud to open, and I'm going to make it open. I'm going to get a hammer, and I'm going to threaten it and demand that the thing open up. I want that rose. I want that rose now. I want the fruit of salvation now. And I'm going to belt that rosebud. I'll open the rosebud all right, but it won't look like a rose. And that's what we do as parents when we demand and threaten our children that unless they do this and that and this and that, God will not love them and God will not save them. You are applying the hammer to the rosebud. What you must do as a parent is to introduce your child to the love of Jesus and the gospel. Get rid of the hammer and let the flower open itself once it's connected to Jesus. It will automatically flower. Obedience is the fruit of being connected to the root. Obedience is not the root. Here's a beautiful starry night and the sailor is out on his ship with his sextant. And he's going to navigate through the seas using this instrument. These beautiful stars that are going to guide him through the course. He can't touch the stars. They're way above him. But he can set his course by them. And that's what the Ten Commandments is like. It's a standard to set your course in life by. You can't touch it. You can't get there. You let Jesus live out his holiness through you and that is perfect commandment keeping? Yes. But if you do it, you'll mess it up. And if I do it, I'll mess it up. Because we can do many good things for the wrong motive. And if the motive is wrong, the deed will be soiled. Now there are two counterfeits to the gospel, legalism and liberalism. The boys are out drinking. God's forgiven me. God loves me. Jesus did it all. I'm going to the pub and I'm going to get drunk. That's liberalism. The other opposite is, uh, no, God hasn't done everything. I'm going to add to it. That's legalism. Both of them are counterfeit gospels. Which one are you in? There are some Adventists that say it's okay to have wine. It's okay to drink a bit of alcohol. What's wrong with that? That's liberalism. That's not the fruit of the gospel. And if there's an elder or a deacon in one of your churches that's, that's telling you that, I want to know this person. And I want to show to him that the wine in the Bible is nowhere near the strength of wine today. Distillation wasn't invented in Bible times. It was invented well after Bible times. And the alcohol today is much more potent. That's liberalism. That's not the gospel. Jesus has saved me. I can do what I like. No, that's not the gospel. That's a counterfeit gospel. The other extreme is Jesus hasn't done it all at all and I'm going to add to it. That's legalism. That's not the gospel either. And when you stumble on the way to the new Jerusalem, which you will and which I do, I don't need to be rebaptized every time I fail. I will stumble. I will fall on the way to the new Jerusalem, yes. I will stumble a million times. But my trajectory is heavenward. I'm looking to Jesus. I'm not looking to Jesus and now I'm in the world for a couple of months and now I'm back to Jesus again and now I'm back in the world again. I'm going this way. I'm looking to Jesus. I'm looking to a heavenward course. And as I do that, I stumble through weakness and I fail through ignorance. I get up. As Chris said, you get up. You don't lie down. Jesus said the person who's been bathed only needs to wash his feet. You don't have to be rebathed all the time. You'd be in the baptismal font 24-7. You've been on a Qantas flight, what do you do? You just go right in there and you have your seat allocation and you go straight to your seat and you strap yourself in as two complete strangers who you've never met thrust you through the air at 800k. 
per hour at 36,000 feet. That's faith. That is faith. You don't say, well, before I strap myself in, I want to interview the pilots. I want them to open that cockpit door and I want to see their medical records and I want to see their professional file and I want to ask them about their drinking habits and then after I've done that I'm going to go down and check the tyre pressures. Nobody does that. We just go in there and strap ourselves in. Two complete strangers thrust you through the air at 800k an hour at 36,000 feet. That's faith. For those of us who want proof on everything, you exercise faith all the time when you step into, into an elevator. Floor 66, please. As you step into this metal box you've never been in before and these doors close and you're on your own in solitary confinement and up you go. That's faith. And it's even more faith when you're on the top floor going down because the cable could break. That's faith. And you exercise it all the time. When you're driving on the road and you're over a hill, you don't stop the car and say, well, I'm going to get out. I'm going to walk over to the crest of the hill, make sure there's no one there. And you get back in and off you go again. Faith! We do it all the time. And God says, I want you to have faith in what I've done. And I want you to believe what I've done. And we quarrel with it. And we argue with it. Are we crazy? We exercise faith all the time. And faith is an empty hand. There's nothing in it. I don't come to God with something. I come with an empty hand and I say, I receive the gift. I don't understand it all, but I trust you and I believe you. Because I like your character. And I believe your promise. And so faith comes by stop resisting the gospel. If you're resisting what you're hearing today, your faith will grow no more than a peppercorn seed. If you're going to argue with it and say, oh, I don't like that, and I'm going to send him an email, and I'm going to sort him out, that faith of yours, which is at the moment the size of a peppercorn, will not get any bigger. You get faith by not resisting the gospel. Don't come to Christ with full hands full of gifts. We've got nothing to give. Christ is offering us something. He's not demanding something. Will you make a decision for Christ today? For those of you who already made a decision, will you make a new decision and recommit and say, yep, I'm not worried about what people think of me. I'm not afraid to get out of the pew and stand here on the carpet with me. I'm not afraid to do that. Will you do that? Oh, we don't like to do that in Adventist churches, Herb, because we don't want to get too emotional. I'm not asking you to be emotional. I'm asking you to be rational. Make a decision and say, yep, Jesus went all the way to the cross publicly for me and it's not a problem for me to stand up in the pew, walk here and stand with me and face the, face the people, face the people. Oh, that's tough, isn't it? Why is that so tough? Because of pride. Because of pride. People might think, oh, they know what I'm really like and I'm going forward telling people I'm a Christian. Well, you come forward and tell the people today that you've accepted the gift. Will you do that? Will you stand with me and jump for joy at the gospel? As you're at the crossroads, do you leave the church, go to the world? with all its lights and glitter and glamour and nonsense which has a sting in the tail and will destroy you in the end or would you say no I'm going to turn around and I'm going to go to the cross and accept the gift what Jesus has done he's achieved it for me and I accept it by faith will you do that? I'm going to ask those who want to come forward and stand with me and join with me to do it now please quickly and say by coming, I accept the gift by faith. And those of you who don't want to come, don't feel embarrassed. The camera is going, by the way, and this will be on YouTube. I'm going to make it even harder for you. And say by coming, 
I understand the gospel now, Lord. I didn't understand it so well before. I thought I had to do everything. It's been done. And when you accept that gift by faith, you will want to obey God out of love, which is the right motivation anyway. Come forward, Annie. Now, you're a better evangelist than I am because your example has taught us that it's not through works, it's through faith. Let's have prayer. Lord, this is a wonderful moment. This is not something we do often in churches, but I believe we should do it more because it's not that difficult to reach out our empty hand. We bring nothing. And we say we accept it because we believe you. We trust you. We have faith in the promise that it has been done. And Jesus is our saviour. And now that we've made this decision, we want to follow you and obey. And we believe in the Ten Commandments. It's your holy commandments to guide us through life. But our salvation is on what Jesus has done. Bless all these dear people as they take the notes home and read Romans 3 and 4 and 5 until the message is through into their hearts. May lives be changed, households be changed, attitudes change, criticism leave this church, picking at each other, may that all go. Jealousy, theological arguments, wrangling, fighting over everything, eating everything on the plate except the Brussels sprouts. Lord, we're eating the Brussels sprouts. Well, we like what we've eaten. We like the taste of it. Bless all these dear people and keep them safe. I ask in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen.